All right. Thank you for joining us. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Natalie Waters, who is the Wildlife Conservation Coordinator with BITNEP. So BITNEP is Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program. Natalie is responsible for coordinating wildlife conservation projects within BITNEP's Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan, CCMP. The action plan she works under within the CCMP is the protection and enhancement of native biological resources, which include projects working with plants, pollinators, fish, shellfish, birds, and additional wildlife. Natalie has led or partnered with organizations to develop and carry out many projects that fall within the action plan throughout her years at BITNEP. One of the new projects she is working on is developing a pollinator conservation program that aims to build a framework that encourages landowners to manage their land in a way that maximizes its suitability as habitat for pollinators. And then in her spare time, she enjoys wildlife photography, hiking, reading, gardening, traveling, and spending time with her husband and their three fur babies named Rose, Blanche, and Dorothy. All right, a few tongue twisters in there. Natalie, thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, everybody. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Can everybody see it? Can you see it, Jane, on your end? Okay, it's not sharing yet. Let's see. Share, share. Yeah. Working now? Awesome. Thanks everyone for having me. Again, my name's Natalie Waters. Um, I'm the Wildlife Conservation Coordinator for BITNEP. And today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our newest program, um, our uh, pollinator conservation program. So a little bit of an outline for the talk. I'm gonna go briefly over the BitNet program, um, some pollinator background, the BitNet pollinator program activities, and then some pollinator observations in our gardens that we created. So a little bit about BitNet. Um, we are one of the 28 uh, national estuary programs, and we are located between the Mississippi and the Atchafalaya rivers. It covers an area of 4.2 million acres. And we are a small office, but we um, try to do a, a lot of different things from habitat restoration to migratory and resident birds, invasive species, outreach, native plant production, education, volunteer programs, and water quality. So as Katie mentioned, um, we follow a plan called the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan or CCMP. And there's a lot of um, action plans within that, um, but I work under the EM15 protection. It originally, um, we focused mainly on the protection of habitat for migratory and resident birds. But um, recently um, we updated our CCMP to include, um, it, to focus on all the areas that's within the CCMP. And our newest addition is also a pollinators section. So we'll start from the basics. Oh, is it working? You might want to click right there to, to reduce all of that. Oh, this one? The, the, the line. No, sure. Thank you. So um, pollination is the transfer of pollen from stamen to stigma, the pollen from the male part of the uh, plant to the female part of the plant. Oh, I don't think it's going anymore. Dang. <laughs> It's not going anymore. Let's see. There it goes. <laughs> and then more, some more of the basics. What is a pollinator? Um, it's an animal that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. And the movement of pollen must occur for the plant to be fertilized to produce seeds. Some plants are self-pollinating while others must be fertilized by pollen carried by wind or water. But the vast majority of them um, are pollinated by insects and other animals. So the plant pollinator relationship, most of that, uh, the relationship is mutual where both species benefit, not all, there's no, there's no absolutes in biology, um, but the plants uh, need them to get the pollen transported, then the animal gets a reward uh, via either pollen, which is high in lipids and minerals and starch and nectar as well. So there's a variety of different pollinators from bees to butterflies, 
butterflies and moths um, to birds, bats, and additional small mammals as well. Why are they important? Because 80% of the world's flowering plants require a pollinator to reproduce. And one in three bites of food we eat are the result of animal assisted pollination. And on top of that, they support our healthy ecosystems. So this is a diagram to kind of show um, the day to day impacts that pollinators have in our lives. So obviously from the food we eat to the livestock that depend on alfalfa, um, which is a, um, pollinated by um, species like the leaf alfalfa leaf cutter bee, which produces um, dairy products as well as our um, beef products to even the clothes that we wear to our vitamins and everything in between. Um, we need them and they need our help because they are in decline. At least 28% of North America's bumblebee species have undergone significant declines. Half of our leafcutter bee species and 27 of our mason bee species are at risk. 19% of our butterflies in the U.S. are at risk. And as we all know, it's not just the pollinators. Um, a recent study published in the Journal of Biological Conservation says that 40% of all insect species are in decline and could die out in the coming decades. And we, as you all know, since 1970, North America has lost 3,000 birds. So everything is connected. Um, and that's the bummer part. Let's get to the... The good part now. <laughs> so um, in 2020, um, we just uh, launched our pollinator um, conservation program. We received a, a grant from U.S. Fish and Wildlife was called grant to help make this happen. And so our project goals were to increase the pollinator education and awareness within the community. We also wanted to create a monarch butterfly and additional pollinator habitat by creating these uh, small pollinator demonstration gardens. We also wanted to host native milkweed and digital plant species giveaways to encourage people to create pollinator habit in their backyard and to encourage local garden groups um, to develop pollinator friendly programs and practices. So since 2020, we've done we've done all those things. We've planted native milkweed and nectar plants um, and on public lands. We've provided native milkweed um, giveaway events and educational events. Uh, we developed a pollinator resource web page and we did a social media campaigns um, and we also encourage citizens to monitor pollinators to use by using the iNaturalist app as well. So can I make this thing go away? I don't know. Do you guys see that little screen? I'm trying to make it like go. That will, okay. It's kind of like in front of my words. So I don't know how to make it go away. Anyway, um, it's, let's see, there it goes. It's moving now. Very good. So um, like I said, we started, um, we kicked it off in 2020. We, we, we did it, which was a hard year to start as we all know. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm like, oh, no, I don't know how we're going to do this. But we ended up um, starting our uh, we did our first giveaway and we've done one giveaway every um, year since. And so far, we've given away 1,717 plants, um, several different native plant species, including three native milkweed species. And we wanted to use it as a, a great public outreach tool to to encourage people to um, plant plant native plants for pollinators and wildlife. My clicker is not going. There. So this was last year's event. Um, and one of the fun things about these events is the excitement from the little kids that come up. They are so excited to learn about the plants and um, what you can find on the plants. Like this is one of our, our native milkweed species, um, butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa, and the, the little boy in the middle is looking down because he sees a little monarch caterpillar on there. So he was excited he got a plant and a caterpillar. So like I mentioned before, we were, uh, started this by getting a, a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We also partnered with the St. Francis Vegetable Garden. Um, it's a um, nonprofit that is within Thibodeau and Homa. So they're a community vegetable garden and they grow vegetables to donate to the food bank. And so we thought this would be a perfect partnership to add these pollinator gardens 
um, where their locations are next to their vegetable gardens. It's a win-win situation, right? So we installed four pollinator gardens <clears throat> within the three vegetable garden sites in Homa and Thibodeau in the fall of 2021. And we had help with the um, from the master gardeners there. They helped plant the seeds to grow out the plants for us. We grew out a total of 392 plants using 25 different native plant species. Um, we used th uh, three different native milkweed species, the tuberosa incarnata and prentice, and 14 species of plants are butterfly hosts. And several plants um, support specialist bee species, which I'll get into a little bit and just a little bit. So this is um, 2021 when we, we, we um, grew out the plants. We did, this was for both the gardens and the giveaway that year. And here are some of the um, lists of plants that we use from swamp milkweed, butterfly weed to narrowly purple coneflower, giant ironweed, purple coneflower, spotted bee balm, lemon mint, Mexican hat, and many more. <laughs> And so this was the fall of 2021 where we were installing um, the pollinator gardens. Um, and you can see that I, I planted, a, I wanted to plant a lot close together, probably more than what a lot of people would want to <clears throat> normally do. They like traditionally more spaced out plants, but I wanted to plant them close together because I wanted them to like fill in quicker and naturally compete and, um, also get, give less room for weeds to grow in. So I planted them pretty dense. So that's when we first planted them. And then the next year, this is um, in around um, late April, how quickly they started to, to grow in. And these aren't huge gardens. They're like probably 15 by 15 or 15 by 20. So they're not huge, but they're they're big enough to make an impact for sure. And then this was in, in midsummer of last year. We also put out some educational signage that we got from the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, and these are really neat signs because it talks about why native plants are important, of course, about the monarch butterflies and gardening for pollinators. And they also come with a little um, QR code reader that people can use their phones to scan that and then um, learn more uh, about planting for, for pollinators. Additionally, we, we wanted to put these gardens in a place um, where the communi communi community can use them. Um, like the, we have one at the Homa Main Library branch and they were really excited to have them because they utilize it in their um, children's outreach program. So they use the garden during their La Mariposa educational outreach event where they um, released some butterflies and the kids got to get really excited on those kind of events. So it's uh, a tool that the whole community can, can utilize. So the plants we used in the gardens, we used host plants for butterflies, plants for specialist bees. We wanted to do variable bloom times. So you want something bring, blooming in the spring, summer and fall, and you want variable flower structures and colors as well to attract the, the maximum amount of, of insects. And I'm going to highlight just a few of the plant species we used in the garden. Um, the aquatic milkweed, uh, Sleucus perennis, is a really good one to have, especially in southeast Louisiana. Um, it's a good one, especially for the monarch migration, because it's the one that that comes up the quickest. Um, and that's paired with the monarch migration, so they'll actually have something to lay their eggs on, whereas the other native ones are a little bit slower than this one. Um, and it doesn't get as tall. It only gets one to two feet tall. And then the next we have the swamp milkweed, which is Asclepius incarnata. That one does get pretty tall, four to five feet. Um, and it's a good one to have, especially in wet areas as well. Mm -hmm. And then butterfly weed. Um, a lot of people get this one confused because of the name. It's not the tropical. Um, this is the native one. Um, and it, it did really well in, in, in our gardens too, so, but they don't get too tall. We also have the purple cone flower, which is a host plant to the silvery checker spot butterfly. Mexican hat's a really pretty one that a lot of people liked in the giveaways. It, the structure of the flower and the color also with the, the leaves, people really like that. And it produces a lot of 
flowers. So that was really good. And it seeds readily too. Spotted bee balm is a great one to have. Um, planted three different types of bee balms. We did lemon bee balm, um, wild bergamot, and then spotted bee balm. And the reason I like those is because they all came up at a different time. So the lemon bee balm came up first in the early spring, and then it died back. And to replace that, the wild bergamot came up right after that one was dying back. And then when that one died back, the spotted bee balm came up. So we had that whole bee balm cycle covered for that, the whole season. Gulf Coast Penstemon is another pretty one to have, and it's already actually blooming on some of the plants that we have. So it's a good early bloomer to, to have as well. Little blue stem is a, is a, now people think, how is that helpful for pollinators? Well, it's actually a host plant to some skipper butterflies. So um, it does help our pollinators and it also provides good cover and habitat for, for a lot of insects. And it's also a good, um, just to fill up some space whenever you wanna try to fill up some space in the gardens. In addition to that, we also started a seed library program um, in 2022. So in addition to doing the giveaways, um, we wanted to, I partnered with the Latera Master Gardeners to um, package seeds. That way we could create a little seed library at our local library so people can come and get free seeds. So we gathered seeds from the, um, the leftover seeds we had from growing out the gardens and collected seeds from the gardens and people also donated seeds. And we created a 1,235 seed packets containing over 88,000 seeds. And we have two locations right now, the Homa Branch Library and the Thibodeau Library. And we just had another event in February where we had another seed processing and packaging event where we created 2,000 seed packets. So, and we're going to be opening up a new little seed library in the Lockport Library. And we couldn't do all this without the master gardener. So it's a good partnership that we have with them and very grateful to have them. And now to our native bees, our unsung heroes. So when you think of bee, the first thing you think of is our honeybee. But there's a lot more to the bee world than just our honeybees. So we're going to dive into that. We have over 20,000 bee species in the world. 4,000 are native to the U.S. and over 200 are uh, Louisiana. Louisiana has over 200 native species bee species. So why are bees really important for pollination? Well, they're the best ones overall. They forage for both pollen and nectar and they exhibit flower constancy. So they'll go to the same species and, and are highly effective at pollinating um, plants because they, they'll go to the same species until they move on. Honeybees are not native. They originally imported from Europe um, and they're for people. So They've been domesticated for honey. Obviously, we have the, the wild ones now, but they're brought over for honey and also to pollinate our agricultural crops. So you got to remember that beekeeping is for people and it's not a conservation practice for our native bees. And honeybees are a lot different than the vast majority of our native, native bees. Honeybees are eusocial or true social animals living cooperatively in a colony. Um, as are most species of bumblebees, but most of our native bees are actually solitary, 90% of them. So a little differences between honeybees and native bees. Um, like I said before, they the honeybees live in large colonies, whereas most are native bees are solitary with all the females capable of reproduction. So they don't have queens besides our uh, bumblebees. And then honeybees, have worker female bees to take care of the young. And then um, the native bees, it's a single female that gathers pollen and creates individual nest cells in the in the ground or stem. And then the honeybees, the queen can lay up to 2000 eggs in a single day. And then um, the native bees, females will lay only 20 to 30. Queen can live for up to seven years, whereas the native bees, females, the adults die after a few weeks. And then of course the honeybees will defend their nest site and most native bees will not. And then also bee, honeybees are active year round, whereas most native bees are not active year round. They spend most of their life um, as a larva or a pupa and at their adult phase, they are only last for a few weeks. 
So there's a lot of different families of bees. Um, the six most com common ones in the U.S. include Apidae, Halictidae, Andrinidae, Megachylidae, Colididae, and Melididae. Yay, Latin. Um, and they came in all different sizes, too. So in this diagram, you can see the smallest, U.S. is smallest bee. This is the scale compared to the largest. And when you're looking at bees, it's important to know um, the different way they collect their pollen. So most honeybees and bumblebees collect their pollen as a wet lump in a little pollen basket called the corbicula on their rear legs. And the mo um, most native bees, they have what's called scopa, these dry hairs that are on their leg or on the underside of their abdomen, like that leafcutter bee image at the top. And then the, the zoomed image, is, image of the lay, you can see that's all dry pollen. And it's important to remember if you see uh, um, a bee collecting pollen, you know it's a, a female because they're the only ones that will collect it to feed their young. There's also different types of bees um, depending on what they pref pollen preference. So there's specialist versus generalist bees. So most bees can be separated into those two broad categories. It gets complicated even after that though. Um, so specialist bees have evolved from a specific relationship with a few or just even one plant species. So it's kind of like the host plants for butterflies. Bees kind of do that too, some of them for, for, um, for their collecting pollen to feed their young. So these specialists emerge from their nest the same time their host plants begin to flower. So that's why it's important with things like climate change we need to really, this can really affect our, our bees, especially our specialist bees. And roughly about a quarter of the, of the species of native bees to the East United States are pollen specialists, and many of them are listed as rare. Generalist bees, as the name implies, are less picky. So like your honeybee is a perfect example of your generalist bees. So this kind of breaks it down even further to the different bee feeding strategies. So polylectic, it means that the bees exhibit a broad, wide preference of pollen, so like your honeybee. Oleoglectic means that the bees exhibit more of a narrow, specialized preference for pollen and nectar. It's usually to a single family or a genus. And then monolectic is the ones that are really picky. They exhibit extremely narrow, specialized preference for pollen, typically to a single species. So the picture right there is an example of one of those monolictic species. Lazioglossum onithorae is um, one of the ones that will only collect from the evening pollen only from the evening primrose. Here's some more specialist bees examples. So we have one called the blueberry digger bee or southeastern blueberry bee. It resembles a small bumblebee. Um, it nests in the ground but they're also like bumblebees capable of buzz pollination. And um, to show how effective they are, one scientific study concluded that a single female collecting um, blueberry, visiting blueberries, um, all, uh, visits almost 50,000 rabbit eye blueberries in its lifetime, contributing <laughs> to the production of nearly 6,000 blueberries. So that's pretty impressive. We also, another example is our, the squash bees. So this bee relies on, um, squash to collect its pollen from. Um, and you can see an illustration right there. They kind of look like, if you don't look close enough, they kind of look like your honeybee, um, but they're another specialist bee as well. And if you're interested in learning more about specialist bees, you could visit that website at the bottom, um, jaredfowler.com specialist bees. He has a whole list of the ones that are, yeah, I think he has Eastern and Western United States ones and he'll list like their what plants they prefer as well. So it's also important to know about where they nest. So ground nesting bees, 70% um, of them will nest in the ground in the tunnel and bare earth. And this little diagram is a good um, diagram of illustrating that. So the female will dig into the earth and she'll create all these little tunnels and then she'll go collect pollen and make her little pollen loaf. And then she'll lay her egg on top of that and then she'll seal off the top of the chamber right there. And the other ones are cavity nesting bees. So they nest in like hollow stems, logs, or rock crevices. crevices. Um, the female leafcutter bee is a good example of that. So like her name implies, 
she'll go and cut little por portions of a leaf, like a little circle, like the picture shows. And then she'll use that to create a, her line, her brood cells inside a cavity. And so um, after she creates all the brood cells, then she'll seal it off. So we're gonna go into the insects detected in the gardens in 2022 last year. So I documented 74. For the grant, I, we mainly were required to just do the, the um, educational outreach, like the giveaways, create the demonstration gardens. But I was curious and I wanted to see what was utilizing the um, gardens. And so I went out there and started documenting the different insects that I found. Um, and we documented 74 insect and spider genera slash species representing 29 different insect families present within the gardens. There's obviously a lot more than that, but these are the ones that I, that I found. So it was an observational presence-based effort, um, but the preliminary findings suggest that we it would be really great if we could use uh, various approaches to the methodology of monitoring. So this was kind of like me saying, let's do more because we can learn a lot more from this if we really dive into monitoring these kind of gardens and then bringing in the community to help monitor them as well. So I use field guides uh, to insects of North America. I used a guide to North America's bees, bees in your backyard. Um, bugguide.net, and um, there's a lot of experts on iNaturalist um, that also will confirm your identifications for you as well. So let's meet some of our pollinators. We had uh, over 19 different bee general slash species, 20 different wasps, 14 butterfly, five flies, three moths, and additional insects and spiders that I'm not going to mention here, but I'm going to highlight some of them. So one of my favorites is the leaf cutter bees. I mean, look at them. They're adorable, for one. <laughs> They're so cute. Um, and these photographs, these are all the ones that I, I found in the garden. So um, <laughs> the leaf cutter bees, they will nest in the hollow twigs and stalks and, and also in the ground. And like I mentioned before, they cut leaf and flower pieces and, and build the nest inside the cavity. So the females carry the pollen on the underside of their abdomen, but you can see a really good illustration of that, of the megachylae prunia right there. Um, and there is um, a lot of, in a lot of these bees, uh, sexual dimorphism. So the males look different from the females. So if you look at the carpenter mimic leaf cutter bee, um, you can see the male looks uh, a little different from the female. And the same with the thumbed leaf cutter bee, that's the male, but the female looks different as well. So keep that in mind whenever you're looking at, at bees as well. So Apidae is the largest family of bees um, and they include a lot of different bees from uh, sizes and colors. And um, we have cuckoo and carpenter and digger and bumble and honey and many, many more. Um, the majority nest in the ground, but also includes some twig nesters as well. And one of those is that I found in the garden. So we have American bumblebee, two spotted longhorn bee, the Sand Hills longhorn bee, and the Eastern carpenter bee here. But um, one of the exciting ones I found was the Sand Hills longhorn bee, which is on that Mexican hat right there. It's uh, I learned after photographing and getting ID confirmation that it's a specialist bee and it specializes on the Asteraceae plant family. It is listed as rare. It's found in the Southeastern US. And um, so I was really excited because what's neat about trying to document your, your native bee species is we don't know as much um, about them because they're not as closely monitored. We don't have a lot of people monitoring them like we do eBird, for example. So, um, so when you find something and, and you get to doc and what's cool about sharing about on iNaturalist, other scientists can utilize that information as well. So you're you're helping contribute to to their database. And she's super cute. Like look at her. <laughs> Another fun topic is cuckoo bees, kleptoparasitic bees. So you can tell when you first look at it, you're like, is that a bee or a wasp? And the reason that it's confusing is they they don't collect pollen to feed their young. They're a cuckoo bee. So they will go and they'll females will lay their eggs 
and nests of other bee species. And so when her young hatch that kills the host egg and larva and feeds on the pollen of the collected the pollen collected by the host bee. And the that the wasp-like appearance is 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 obvious and they also have no pollen carrying structures because they don't do that. They just dump their their babies in other bees' nests. So the lunate the lunate longhorn cuckoo bee likes to and this makes sense, right? I took this photo and it was the time of year when I was seeing a lot of um, two-spotted longhorn bees. And when I documented what this was, I'm like, it makes sense it's there because there's a lot of two-spotted longhorn bees. So it was taking advantage and finding those nests of the two-spotted longhorn bees to, to go um, lay her eggs in. And another one is the sharp-tailed bees, which is uh, the lower picture as well. And then we have our Helictidae, which is our sweat bees. And they also come in a huge variety of colors and sizes and social behaviors, especially social behaviors. Some are solitary, some are semi-social, and some are communal nesters. So that's a whole nother ball game, just trying to learn just about your sweat bees. <laughs> and by communal nesters, they um, it's like a, an apartment building. So they'll share the entrance of a nest but they'll still go make their own little um, individual cells. So the, the female is kind of like, okay, you look out and make sure not one of those cuckoo bees is coming. And then you, and then when I leave, you take a look out. So, um, and also they, they come in beautiful colors as well. I was really excited to see that subgenus. I'm going to try and say it. I'm going to, I'm going to slaughter it. Subgenus paroglochlorpus. <laughs> the blue bee, guys. The blue bee. I was excited to see that one. I'm um, really super excited. And then the Norton's Nomia was a really fun find. The brown winged striped sweat bee and the Poe's furrow bee. You can see they all come in different shapes and sizes. So gardening for bees. Um, like I mentioned before, you definitely want to plant different species that bloom throughout the year because different bee species will, will emerge at different times of the year because a lot of them will time when they come, the adults come out based on when uh, fl certain flowers are blooming. So if you have something blooming throughout the year, then you're gonna um, attract more, a higher diversity of bee species. And of course they like bright white, yellow, blue, and purple. And you wanna choose plants with different flower structures as well. Oh, it's not moving again. So um, while I was out there photographing these bees, I also um, kept track of what plants they were utilizing. And one of the the top the top one was actually butterfly weed. Um, it's it's a great nectar source. I saw the the, the highest diversity of, of bee species on this plant because it's a great nectar source. Bees don't collect pollen because from it because uh, milkweeds use these sticky pollen sacs that stick to their legs. So they don't collect it, but the the um, the milkweed still is able to um, to be pollinated because it puts these sticky pollen sacs on their on their legs. Um, we had ten different um, genera or species in our in our pollinator gardens, just on on that plant. The next one is sneezeweed. It's a great nectar and pollen source. It also has a pretty long bloom period from summer to fall, and it produces a lot of flowers within, with on the single plant. Then it also spreads from seed easily. And we had nine different species that I found on that plant. And then Indian blanket flower was the third uh, favorite. Yeah, everybody loves Indian blanket flower. So some additional species for bees that they like, your bergamots, your goldenrod, ironweed, joe pieweed, sunflowers is a really good one to have, your native sunflowers and coneflowers. It's also important to not only provide um, pollen and nectar resources, but also nesting habitat for bees. So you want to save the stems and you could plant a log and you all want to leave the leaves because um, certain species do nest in the ground and your um, queen bumblebees will also hibernate un underneath leaf litter as well. And one of the reasons you wanna 
um, leave your your plant stems is because um, this is a, a close in picture of uh, a Joe pie weed and it has a hollow stem. And this was in my backyard and I, I knew that the leaf cutter bees will nest in there. So I, I camped out there and I was <laughs> like, eventually I'm gonna see one of these. And I did, um, it's not the greatest photograph because um, that's actually, it's a snap from a video but she was, you can see her with the little blue arrow. She's carrying in her leaf and she just flop, goes right in that stem to make her nest. So leave the stems as well. And your old, your new growth will come up and hide your, um, your, your stems anyway. So it's not gonna be an eyesore or anything. And you're providing nesting habitat for, for bees. And wasps are pollinators too. Shout out to wasps. Everybody doesn't like wasps, but they are pollinators too. And we, it's important to remember that most wasps are solitary nesters and they don't defend their nest like your social wasp nests. Um, and without wasps, we wouldn't have bees because bees evolved from wasps. Um, and the adults do visit flowers for nectar and they do feed their young insects. And for the for the plant that they liked to visit the most, it was the spotted bee balm. So that's where I saw the, the most amount of wasps it was on our spotted bee balm. And it's also important to remember that wasps help control your pest insects. So if you have a vegetable garden, I think it'd be a good idea to, to, put, to put some of the spotted bee balm near it because the, the wasp will be attracted to that for the, um, the nectar, but they'll also collect the pest insects to feed their young with. So win-win. And um, we had four different families of wasps found in the gardens. And that was the highest species diversity of pollinators that we had was from our wasps. Um, and they come with all different names as well. We got spider wasps, thread-waisted wasps, paper mason wasps, and more. Um, and here's a few photos from them. And a really fun one that I found was, it has a really cool name too, smoky winged beetle bandit wasps. It's a really cool name and it has a really cool story. So hence the name, it feeds its larvae beetles from the jewel and metallic wood boring beetles, including the invasive emerald ash borer, which um, actually scientists use this wasp species to actually monitor for the invasive emerald ash borer. They'll go and find the nest of this beetle bandit wasp and they'll they'll put a recorder by it and they'll see if they're bringing in that emerald ash borer to feed their young so butterflies and moths so it's important to remember um, that moths outnumber butterflies eight to one and they are a huge there's a huge amount of species in the world and almost all butterflies depend on flower nectar as a source for energy. And of course, caterpillars eat plants, leaves before pupating and becoming adults. So we had 14 species of butterflies that were detected in our garden and three moth species. So as you all I'm sure are familiar with, um, to attract butterflies, you need to provide their nectar plants, but also their host plants as well. So some of the host plants we have in our pollinator gardens were frostweed and purple coneflower for the silvery checker spot butterfly, giant ironweed for American lady, yellow white indigo, rose mallow, swamp butterfly, of course, for the swamp butterfly and aquatic milkweed for your monarch butterflies and a little blue stem for your skippers. The a number one nectar plant that we saw the most butterfly species on was your purple coneflower. So that was my favorite for them. And flies are pollinators too. Um, they prefer white and yellow flowers with open structures that are easy to access. So uh, these, these flies that pollinate are also known as hoverflies, surfid flies, and flower flies. And in some cases, they can actually be provide more consistent pollination in early spring than bees just because they are often more active than bees in cooler temperatures. And the adult flies visit uh, flowers to feed on. And then um, some of them will often mimic the appearance of bees as a defense mechanism. So you've got to look kind of closely at them and be like, is that a bee or a fly? And you look closely at them, you'll be able to see um, because flies have those, those big, big eyes, very short antenna, and they also only have the two wings instead of the four. And so here's a double banded plushback fly on frostweed. 
And then you'll get to find stuff, uh, fun ones like this one I'm about right to tell you about. We had five species detected in our gardens. Um, they're mainly attracted to white and yellow flowers. Um, but then I saw this one right here and I'm like, what is that? Is that a wasp? Is that a bee? Is that a fly? And it is actually uh, one of the fly species and it's from a family known as the Conop Conopidae thick-headed fly family. And then this head popped his head out and this is what it looks like. It is Physocephala sagittaria, and it doesn't have a common name. That's that's it. Um, and the adults feed on uh, flower nectar. It obviously mimics wasps, and it also uses flowers to find its host for its young. So it's a parasitoid wasp. So it hangs out to sip on the nectar, but it also waits for a unsuspecting bee to come, and it pounces on the bee host and inserts its eggs into its abdomen and the larvae slowly feed on it until it dies. <laughs> but it was a cool find. I was excited to find that one. And then hummingbirds. <laughs> As we all know, they're excellent pollinators. They have that ability to hover in place. They, of course, their diet is nectar and also small insects. Um, people forget about how the importance of small insects like flies and spiders are for um, hummingbirds because they need that source of protein as well, especially when they're nesting. Um, we didn't have any hummingbirds in our garden that's been recorded yet, but I'm sure they're there. And if not, they will be. Um, Louisiana's, as you guys know, the Louisiana's, we have wintering hummingbirds. Um, in order of abundance, Rufus is the most common, followed by Black Chin, Buff Bellied, Calliope, Allens, and Broad Tailed. And um, we have a, a good humming, uh, Bitten Up Hummingbird publication online um, called Bitten Up. Just Google Bitten Up Louisiana Hummingbird, and you'll be able to check that one out as well. So gardening for hummingbirds, you want red flower, red tubular flowers, um, but they also need protection. Um, you know, not only nectar plants, but also um, places where they can go and hang out in uh, oaks and wax myrtles and Carolina cherry laurel and, um, of course, nectar plants to get, th get throughout the seasons. So some hummingbird plants, um, shrimp cap, Turk's cap, bottle brush, coral honeysuckle is a good one, and many, many more. So some of the major takeaways. Um, is to remember that small gardens or container gardening still makes an impact. These gardens that we planted, these little demonstration gardens weren't huge, but you can see all the, the uh, goodies that we found within it just in the first year. So I'm excited to see what we find um, this year. And that when you garden for pollinators, it gives, <clears throat> and other wildlife, it gives gardening a deeper purpose. You're providing habitat. Um, Try and have several plants blooming for each season is an important thing to remember and use natives as much as possible. And you'll always be learning and forgetting and relearning and you'll pause more and you'll look closer at your garden and you'll become more mindful and you'll go from a gardener and an advocate as well. So, and that's, I just have some recommendation slides after this. So some recommended websites to go learn more. Um, Doug Tallamy's Homegrown National Park Native Plants list is a good one. Don't forget about the Louisiana Native Plant Society. They're a really good re, um, re, resource page. Some native plant and seed sources in Louisiana. And recommended books as well. And that's all I have for you guys today. So, thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Your um the gardens that you created near the vegetable gardens, did you amend the soil or did you basically just yeah it was there? We then... we killed the grass and we amended the soil, uh, but we we only added um as you can see on the, the perimeter, we only added a little bit of topsoil on the top. So we didn't with native plants, you don't you don't even need to do that. I mainly just did that just to help with drainage, but did you have a method that you liked for killing those the grass? Well, we tried like solarization where you, you just lay a piece of plastic over it, but you also kill all the healthy like microbes as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Yeah, Roundup probably works the best. <laughs> yeah. I just wondered because some of the plants that you mentioned are more dry. Yeah. It it does a lot better with a little yeah with better drainage yeah so you want to add yeah put it yeah add some more soil and and then it'll do a lot better yeah and it's one of those plants too where you you know if you plant it in one spot and then you only go you know so many feet over here this one will do good and that one won't do good so you got to play around with it to see. <laughs> We uh we we grew them from seed. Okay. Yeah. And so we're doing another giveaway. Yes, we're doing another uh giveaway. We just uh we have I think we potted around eighteen hundred. Um, we sowed about eighteen hundred pots. Um, but we won't get all of them to germinate, obviously. But we'll probably we'll probably do another giveaway in 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 May. Are you taking care of all of them? Yeah. <laughs> me and the and the um student workers that helped me as well so and those giveaways are in Helma? um Thibodeau we Thibodeau. we were doing at the we actually partnered with Lowe's they let us come because I wanted to educate them about the value of native plants and not using pesticides on your plants and <laughs> so I reached out to, I I know I'm trying I reached out to them and and I said um can we can we set up a little um spot in your parking lot by your garden section and do our giveaway and they're like sure I was surprised they they let us so and they actually were really excited about it because um whenever we did do our give whenever we do do our giveaways they get a lot of um uh people come and visit and say oh I was so excited that they did their giveaway you know and I learned a lot and so then then they also go buy stuff from Lowe's too so win-win <laughs> What about the garden maintenance? Yeah, um, people always think with native plants, there's no maintenance, but there's still maintenance like any other garden. Um, so we have the four different gardens and you go to um, one of them each week. So you we go and maintain them at least so once a month. So if we, so we have four different gardens, we'll go to this garden this week, <coughs> next garden next week. So, but yeah. Planting them closer together, it, it it helps because you don't have as much competition from weeds. So um, don't be afraid to plant your plants a little closer together. Are you letting other natives that arrive on their own other desirable? I will, yeah. <laughs> there are some that will come in, but there are also some like on a goldenrod that will take over. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't want that because it will take over. Yeah. And I have to watch the frost wheat. Like like yeah, we'd let those stay. We just manage them to where they don't like we don't want them to take over. So but like with frost weed is the one of the ones that if you let it it'll take over too. So we have to manage that one as well. So Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we haven't mailed any of them out. Um, what we're trying to do though is we want to, we want this to spread. So we're trying to, um, we're trying to replicate this partnership where I, I want to reach out to other master gardeners in different locations and say, hey, um, we would really like for you to to partner and work with like um, this group could be perfect with a master gardener group and you guys could work together to create these seed packets to your library. So we definitely want to see it replicated. So that's one of our goals to try to replicate it and in, in throughout the state. So. might ask if there are any questions from the online. Oh, there, there's nothing in the chat that I okay. see, but if anybody has a question and wants to unmute themselves and ask. <clears throat> I don't think they can hear me. Oh, okay. Um, does anybody um online have any questions? Um, we want to let them know too. Probably everybody who's already there. 
Okay. Yeah, so yeah, they're going to be posting this on the Baton Rouge Audubon Society YouTube uh, as well. So you guys can look at that as well there. I'll ask a question. Oh, I think I think someone also said on here. So I'm I'm curious do you you know when you look at your generalists versus your specialist bees? We have two questions. I'm sorry. Just, sorry, um what was what was that? You when you were talking about your specialists versus your uh generalist bees? Mm -hmm. Do you, do you know that there's any competition between them? Um I'm sure there is because especially with the generalist, um, like your honeybee, there can definitely, because honeybees can visit so many different flowers and there's so many of them. So there's definitely competition there. And for example, um, on the butterfly weed, I have a video that I took and the, the, the smaller leaf cutter bees were like trying to attack the, <laughs> the American bumblebee that was all around there as a well. So there's definitely, they definitely compete for resources for sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And do you have a question? Yeah, I think, uh, tan, I think teenagers like to munch on some, some bees. <laughs> so I'm a candidate that's even lost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Any other questions? I don't know if anybody's on the chat or not. <coughs> yes. Share the slides and the answer to that. Yes, we're gonna see yes, share the slides. On the YouTube video. On the YouTube video, you can see the slides. Good deal. Thank you, Emily. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.